The White House and the CDC have decided it is time for all of us to mask up again, even if you're vaccinated. We're also going to be talking about a teacher in Fauquier County, Virginia, that was put on administrative leave for pushing back against woke CRT training. And then finally, we're going to ask the question, is Olympic gold medalist Simone Biles a quitter? We discuss all of this and more on Making the Argument, where we make the arguments that help all of us defend a free society. So recently, I was up in New York City. And in order to get to New York City, I decided to take the train. And the train has certain rules, right? That nice government-subsidized Amtrak. And as I'm getting on the train, which was actually pretty easy to get on, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a fan, even though I don't like the tax subsidization, you had to wear a mask the entire time you were on the train, except when you're eating and drinking, because as we all know, COVID knows if you're eating and drinking, it's not allowed to spread. But so I'm wearing the mask, get up to New York City, and, and here's my thoughts on New York City. First of all, I find it fascinating, because here in Culpeper, Virginia, I live on 10 acres. 10 acres up in New York City, they put 10,000 people in 10 acres. And here in Culpeper, Virginia, I put five people, 20 chickens, one turkey, two dogs, uh, three cats, and four goats, right? So, so the difference was incredible, right? The noise, the sounds, the smells, everything in New York City. It's very interesting. I'm usually able to appreciate New York City for about a couple days at a time. And then I've usually got to rush back to some place where the hay bale to people ratio is a little bit more in tune with my personal preference. But having said that, one of the things I noticed about the majestic city of New York was how many people were wearing masks as they're walking around. Now, keep in mind, I'm a freedom guy. So if you want to wear a mask, if you think it's safer for you for health reasons, that should be your choice. I, I don't I do what you want, right? I, I don't have a problem. You wearing a mask doesn't adversely affect me. You not wearing a mask because again, I've, I've already had COVID doesn't really affect me. But now the CDC and Biden, and this is always the question, right? What comes first, the politics or the science? It's the, it's the classic chicken and egg question of our time right now, the politics or the science. But they've essentially put out that they're, they're bringing back the mask mandates to Congress. They're bringing back the mask mandates to the White House. CDC is putting out guidance where they think all of our schools, that all of our kids should mask up for this. And a lot of this is because of the Delta variant. And what I find interesting about this is when you listen to the talk or when you listen to the press discuss the Delta variant, all of a sudden, they're, they're very, very fascinated with percentages. They don't talk as much about actual real numbers. And the reason why I point this out is because I think it's important that there, there's certain ways to tell when the game is fixed, right? And we've talked about this before on economics, when people talk about quintiles, um, or they talk about the top 20% or the bottom 20%, instead of talking about flesh and blood people over the course of their lives. Well, the same thing can be done if you're trying to manipulate statistics, where you only talk about the percentages as opposed to what is happening with individual cases. And what you've seen right now in the press is there is a lot of talk about individual cases of COVID. They're no longer doing like the little death count tickers that they did all through the Trump administration. They're not doing any of that. They're not actually putting out the, the numbers like they used to. The press is not emphasizing the numbers. Now they're talking about percentages. And so you'll see a lot of talk like, oh, we had a 20% increase, 50% increase. Oh, it's mainly in these areas, et cetera. And I'm not saying that that isn't relevant information. But I think all of us kind of get it, right? When someone is just talking about percentages and they're not actually giving us numbers, when six months ago it was all about like individual numbers, individual cases of COVID. You have to ask the question, okay, why the shift in the way they're talking about something? Now, it could be, could be a legitimate reason, right? But from, from what we're seeing, the primary reason it seems to me that the press is focusing so much on percentages instead of individual numbers is because one, we're not seeing huge spikes where we've got like just tens of thousands of people coming down with this, this latest variant of COVID. We're not seeing tens of thousands of people dying of COVID. We're not seeing any of that. And so it makes sense if, if you've already decided in your mind that you wanna support these new mask mandates, or if you wanna support more government controls, or if you like the idea of the government having this kind of power to compel people to do what you want, well, then this is a classic case where you would use a percentage as opposed to a number. Because if you say that the case has jumped from one case to two case, that doesn't, sound very, that doesn't sound very convincing that all of a sudden now we should make significant changes to our lives. But if you say that the cases have increased by 100%, okay, well now that, my gosh, that sounds really, really bad. And, and I think it was, it was telling that in, in one of the White House press conferences when they were asking Jen Psaki 
about different information and different data with respect to the virus, right? Complications, medical complications that people have experienced associated with the uh, vaccine, et cetera. It seems like the White House is very reluctant to put out numbers. Now, their justification for that could be that overall, right, let, let's just say this is their justification. Overall, the vaccine has been largely successful and beneficial. And they're worried that if they start to talk about the fact where there's been problems with the vaccine, that then therefore that will depress the number of people that actually want to get it. So therefore they don't want to mention that or they don't want to tell us the numbers. And, and, on, on, and again, if you agree with that reasoning, then your logic might be, well, hey, they're just, they're just trying to do what they can to protect us. And, and you could make that argument from a public policy perspective. The problem is, is that that's not really following the science when it comes to actually understanding more about how not only the coronavirus works or the variant works, but also how mask mandates work, how government lockdowns work or economic lockdowns work, and how the vaccine or different vaccines are working. But if, if, you're, if you are unwilling to give us the data that you think will achieve a result that you don't particularly prefer, and so you repress that data, or you work with social media companies in order to punish people for either putting out that data or speculating upon that data or lack thereof, well then don't tell me you're following the science anymore. Right? You, you might think in your mind you have a good public policy reason to engage in this sort of activity, but don't call it scientific. And that's one of the biggest problems that I see going forward. And so the two things I wanna cover real quick. There are bad conservative arguments against the, the mask mandates, and there are what I believe to be good conservative arguments against the mask mandates. Okay, the bad ones are the ones that, that suggest that either, you know, COVID is not a threat at all. Clearly COVID is a threat to some people. It presents a higher threat to some people than it does to other people. All right, but if, if your argument starts off with saying, well, this is totally blown out of proportion, or your argument starts off with the idea that this was, you know, you know just all China's fault, the problem with that is that what you're doing is you're giving the other side the ability to latch onto something that you have said that is overly generalized. And now the entire argument becomes that you're a denier or that you don't care about other people or that you want kids and teachers to go into dangerous classrooms, right? You, by, by making a poor argument with overgeneralization in the first part, you have given them an ability to diminish not only your argument, but you. And once you've diminished the person that you're arguing with, now when you put out good information, people are less inclined to listen because they associate you with the previous argument that you made that maybe wasn't as good, right? So the one thing that I really wanna focus on here when we're making the argument about this, these new line of mask mandates is in, in, instead of going straight toward, you know, hey, this was created in a lab in Wuhan or going toward this idea that, you know, masks are worthless or whatnot, Let's just put that on hold for a second and let's look at some good conservative arguments here with respect to things like masks and vaccines, all right? And Congressman Thomas Massey talked about this and, and one, I want you to notice one of the things that he talked about. He basically said that using the government to force people to have something injected into them is violence. And then he followed it up by saying, and if you deny them basic human rights, if they don't get the vaccine, that's also violence. Now, I, I want you to notice what he did here. Because one of the things you see the left doing a lot is talking about consent and talking about violence, right? They, and they will inappropriately say things like, well, you know, speech they don't like is violence. Uh, or they'll, they'll place a, you know, a, a heavy degree of emphasis on consent. Well, what Thomas Massey is doing within his particular argument right there is he's pointing out that if you value consent, well, then compelling someone to stick a needle in their arm with an experimental vaccine is not consent. You might think it's a good idea. You might think that the benefits outweigh the cost of doing that. But the moment you decide that you have the ability or that you have the authority or power to make that decision for someone else, you're now throwing consent out the window for that individual. By the same token, because you're now essentially going to deny someone basic rights or, or access to things that they would ever have access to, and I'm not talking about the private sector making an individual decision, I'm talking about the government preventing you from being able to appreciate things that you would otherwise have access to. He's pointing out the violent nature of that. And this is really important because what it does is it, it puts the argument on the proper footing. I think another good argument would be that um, when we talk about following the science, it's not that we have a problem with following the science because I don't have any problem with the scientific method. I have a huge problem with politicians deciding on what a particular policy will be and then manipulating the word science in order to intimidate, embarrass, or humiliate you into doing what they want. 
That's very different. But the question that you have to ask yourself when you're engaging in conversation, debate, or argumentation with somebody about this is that if you lead off with an overly generalized argument that diminishes, you know, COVID, right? And it's, it's perfectly justifiable to say, look, when we look at COVID compared to other things, you know, it's, it's more dangerous here, it's less dangerous here. That, that's a perfectly reasonable statement. When you make an overly generalized statement to say that it's, it's not really a concern or it's blown out of proportion, what the left comes back and hits you with is, you know, their, their individual experience. Maybe they've had COVID, maybe they lost a loved one to COVID. So for them and that personal experience and that anecdotal component, this is very relevant and very serious. And now you've diminished their experience. And now the, the argument unnecessarily becomes overly emotional, right? So what I would encourage you to do is, is take a look at what Massey did when, when one, he brought up something very relevant. He talked about consent. And the reason why that's important is not only because it's a legitimate question, it's important because he used a term that the left repeatedly uses, and now they're going to have to explain why consent is no longer important. He uses the term violence, which again, most people that I talk to on the left, the whole reason why they're willing to submit to pretty much anything Washington, D.C. puts out or the World Health Organization or the CDC, almost without question, is because they think they're doing it for the betterment of society. They think they're helping other people. And what Massey is showing is that, well, okay, the only way that you figured out to help people in this particular instance is by perpetrating non-consent and violence upon them. That's a contradiction in the values that you claim to support. And so now we, we've, we've put the argument in a framework where they have to defend the contradiction within their own argumentation, right? So step one, avoid the overgeneralizations. Avoid making an argument that's going to be really, really easy for the other side to caricature and essentially take you out of the debate altogether. Focus on the points that actually make sense within the worldview and language that the proponents of these mask mandates or vaccine mandates are pushing, right? My, our, our larger problem, like I don't have a problem with vaccines in general. I don't have a problem with vaccines as a concept. I do think you are crossing a line when you make them mandatory or you potentially punish people because they don't get one because there can be a whole host of reasons to include very, very legitimate scientific, personal, religious, or health reasons on why they can't get something. And you shouldn't be demonizing those people. I don't think you should be using force or coercion to get them to do something you want them to do, even if you think it's for their own good. And then finally, when we look at things like mask mandates, it is perfectly appropriate for us to ask the question and say, well, wait a second, it, what, what is the total benefit? I mean, we've been doing this for over a year now. What is the net benefit from wearing a mask, right? It is the, is the cost associated with wearing masks worth the perceived benefits? And can you provide us the data to justify those benefits, right? Because in that case, now you're not saying, you know, I will never get a vaccine. I will never wear a mask. I mean, you're not saying those things. You're saying, I will, you said you value the science. I would like to see the science which justifies your actions. And if you're only willing to give me a portion of the science, or if you're willing to go to such extreme levels as to shut down anybody's voice who doesn't necessarily agree with the, the conclusions you've come to based off of the data you've analyzed, and, and you're unwilling to take into account conclusions based off of other data or maybe even the same data, well, then now you're not following science. You have made up in your mind what is best, and you're simply using science as a way to manipulate people to do what you want. Right? So each one of those cases, that is a far, you, you have put your argument on far stronger footing when you start off that way as opposed to something that's overly generalized or, or deliberately flippant. Right now, it may frustrate you that you got to do this, but my question, my question every time I ask someone when we're talking about making an argument is what is your goal? If your goal is to just say something that makes you feel better and to kind of rub it in their face, okay, fine, that's your goal. You can do pretty much whatever you want on that. But if your goal is to actually move the conversation in a productive way, and I'm not talking about with somebody that's so convinced that they're never going to listen to you, but if you're talking about somebody that really wants to have an understanding, they want to have a reasonable dialogue about this, well, then don't set your argument up for failure right? by, by resorting to the overgeneralization. And, and again, I think, I think Massey did a good job with talking about from a consent standpoint, from a violence standpoint. I think we also have a very good argument to make that if, if Jen Psaki and the White House and the CDC were being very honest about what they wanted to do, then they would give us more access to the studies associated with this as opposed to cherry picking data and then the press dutifully reporting whatever the White House wants using the sort of language that will manipulate us into thinking one way as opposed to another. Right? The, the truth doesn't need to be manipulated. You can put it out there and allow people to come to logical conclusions. 
Now, we always have a certain sector of the population that no matter how much truth you give them, they will ignore it in favor of what they prefer. Yes. The last time I checked, there's no logical way to avoid that. But the, but the number one way to guarantee that you will have a significant amount of the population stop listening to you is if they feel that you are constantly lying, manipulate, lying to them and manipulating them in order to get them to do what they want as opposed to convincing them of a proper course of action. And that's the distinction that we need to make right now. And I think that, that puts our argument on much, much better footing. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, question. There was a teacher in Fauquier County um, who was put on administrative leave. And again, her claim is that she was put on administrative leave because she's fighting back against some of the, the CRT training that is taking place within our schools. Now, as we've discussed before, a lot of times when we talk about CRT in public schools, the left comes back and says, that's ridiculous. CRT is not in our curriculum. CRT is not on the syllabus. Show us the class where they're teaching CRT 101. And we've explained how, okay, first of all, that's disingenuous. Just because the words critical race theory doesn't appear on your syllabus or your curriculum doesn't mean the tenets or the propositions within critical race theory are not being taught. Right? That's the first point. The second point is simply because you don't interject a, a, a course called critical race theory doesn't mean that you're not creating a situation where teachers feel compelled to teach whatever subject they're teaching, math, English, science, history through the lens of critical race theory. Because it's important to understand, critical race theory is not being talked about within teachers unions and whatnot as if it's one theory among many. It's being taught as if this is the appropriate way to view power structures and, power structures and institutions within the United States. So it's not as if they're telling the math teacher, go teach critical race theory math. What they're teaching the math teacher is, Here's the way to view society. And so when you walk into your classroom to teach math, you should view the children in your classroom through the lens of critical race theory. Now, we can debate all day long on whether that's actually going to produce better results. I think it's going to produce horrible ones. But what I find interesting is it seems like time after time after time, if a student or if a teacher hammers the administration for not being woke enough, for not being CRT enough, for not being left wing enough, not only do they not get punished for this, they typically get rewarded. And as we've seen within the university space, they typically get what they want. But if a more conservative teacher, or let's just say a more neutral teacher that has a problem with a certain way that something like CRT is being taught, if they step forward and say this is wrong and say that there should be changes, well, they get put on administrative leave. They get punished. They get ostracized. And the particular CRT style training that was being taught here I'm going to read this off for you. It was a training program called Deep Equity, which was founded by Gary Howard, a white man who believes that white people are collectively bound and unavoidably complicit in the arrangement of dominance that have systematically favored our racial group over others. Our racial group, meaning the white racial group. Deep Equity teaches progressive ideology and is controversial among parents and taxpayers because it tells educators to explicitly reject and resist any parents who disagree with it. This is according to an article in the Daily Wire called Virginia Teacher Placed on Administrative Leave After Questioning the District's Equity Training Program. Okay, so let's look at the argument here, right? First of all, how does the, what is a bad conservative argument? What is a good conservative argument? Some of the conservative arguments that I've seen that I think are problematic is one, when they say that CRT should be banned. Now, keep in mind, I, I think it's appropriate to say that CRT is not appropriate for you know, primary level education, middle school, or maybe even like early high school. I, th I think it would be perfectly appropriate to say, I don't think that's beneficial. I think it would be perfectly beneficial to tell teachers or to tell teachers unions that it is inappropriate to have a bunch of cinema, cinema, <laughs> seminars, which are pushing CRT training, not as if it's one theory among many, but essentially as if it's the only theory which properly explains institutions within the United States and therefore encourages teachers to teach through the lens of critical race theory, right? We, you can make all sorts of arguments that that's not appropriate. But whenever we talk about, we well, need to ban this theory, it should not be talked about. You are setting yourself up to be caricatured in this role as if you're the book burner, right? It's, it's very easy for the left to come back and say, oh, okay, so you don't like it when we cancel Dr. Seuss, but you wanna cancel these other things that you don't like. Look, you're a hypocrite. You like cancel culture. You just want it to be used for your side, not the other side. That's what happens when we make a bad argument with respect to critical race theory and just say, well, it should be banned. It should not be taught. 
All right, so what's a good conservative argument? Well, I think a good conservative argument is to say that if my public school, which is using my tax dollars, which compels me to send my kids to that school unless I can afford an alternative, if I don't want a particular theory being taught either to teachers as if this is the way that they should view reality when teaching my child or as a, as a subject matter that I don't think is useful for the, the foundational things that we agree on with respect to public education. So for instance, what do we agree on with respect to education? I would hope we would all agree that we want children to be literate. We would, all, we would all want children to be able to properly form a sentence and be able to write and express their thoughts through writing and through speech. We would all agree that we want kids to understand the scientific method. And I would say that we would agree we all want kids to be able to do math, right? We all want them to be able to understand and apply math in a way that's beneficial for them regardless of what they want to do with their lives. Those are things that I would say, regardless of who you are, 95% of the population all agree that that's foundational, right? So when you're in you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, we, we expect that when you leave high school, you're going to be able to read, you're going to be able to write, you're going to be able to understand basic concepts of the scientific method and critical thinking, and you're going to be able to do basic math. Okay, great. So here's my question. Is our public school system doing such a bang-up job in all these areas that we've got all this additional time to contribute to all these other theories, which are just that theories, which is now going to influence the way that our kids are taught how to read, write, do math, and understand critical thinking. I, I would argue that we're not. But even if you said that we were, even if you had said that, no, critical race theory is so elemental, so foundational, so critical, if you will, to the education of our children that it should be imposed, it should be a part of the curriculum. Now the question comes down to, all right, if that's the case, and if someone disagrees with that theory, should they be able to have the option to seek other educational opportunities that work better for their child? If your answer is no, well, then I'm going to suggest to you that what you're now talking about is not a quality public education in the sense of, of something that we as a society can generally agree on. You're now talking about pushing a particular narrative. And if you want to do that, well, then here's the counter argument. If you get to do it for critical race theory, then everybody else gets to do it with the theories they want when they're in power, when they're the ones controlling the legislature, when they're the ones controlling the school board. And they decide they want to push a completely different ideology on every single class, on, on teacher education and training, and they want to make it a qualification for certification, well, then I guess you got nothing to complain about because you advocated for an apparatus, for a system where now politicians get to jump in there and mess around with curriculum in order to decide what ideology is going to be pushed. Right? So instead of making this argument that we should just ban all of CRT, I would prefer an argument where we say, no, make it compete, especially in the university space, within the, the court, make it compete with other theories. This is one theory. Here's, a, here's one way to look at something. Here's another way to look at something. Let's allow, let's allow people to make up their minds for themselves on what they think is more beneficial and what they think, more importantly, is more true and corresponds with reality. The other argument that I think we should be making here is, again, if, we, if, if the vast majority of us can agree that a quality education includes reading, writing, doing math, scientific reasoning, and critical thinking, then we, we have a right to ask ourselves, have we done such a good job with all of that? Right? Or are all the inner city schools in Richmond, Virginia, performing at such a high rate that, that we have time to interject all these other courses and ideas and theories? If the answer is no, then, then we are making a justifiable, ar justifiable argument to say that maybe this isn't the appropriate um, emphasis that we should be placing right now within our kids' education, especially if you're going to confiscate my tax dollars and require me by law to send my child to that school unless I can afford an alternative. The third argument, which I think is the best one and the one that all of us should be making is, you know what? You're the parent. And if you want to teach your kids certain things, you get to make that decision. Right? Not because we always agree with the decisions that you're going to make, but because we recognize that parents generally love and are more concerned about the well-being of their children than some faraway legislature or even some local school board. Right? As much as my colleagues in the General Assembly or the local school board might care about my child, they do not love my child more than I do. How do I know that? Because last time I checked, they're not the ones picking up the tab for their home, their clothes, their food, their medical. No, no, I'm doing that because I love them. And so you don't get to dictate terms to me. If you would like to say that my dollars 
my tax dollars are now going to follow my student to the educational opportunities that I think will best set them up for success. And you can do the same with your tax dollars. I think that's fair. In fact, I think what that does is it takes a lot of the controversy out of this issue because now it's no longer one group of people forcing another group of people or several groups of people to do what they want. Now we're actually provided an element of choice within the system to where we don't have to have these controversies because it's no longer an either or proposition. You want more money spent on a football team. You want more money spent on the music program. You think CRT is a valuable way to teach history. You think the 1776 project is a valuable way to teach history. I got an idea. Why don't we allow for individual choice and then we can test results with respect to how people are performing and operating within society. That would, I think, be, that is a far stronger argument than just coming in and saying we need to ban all of this. Again, if you want to get caricatured as a book burner, make that argument. But if you want to actually put them on the horns of a dilemma, then ask them, can you agree reading, writing, scientific analysis, and critical thinking and math skills are fundamental to any quality education? If you can agree to that, well, then can you please explain why we're spending all this additional time, effort, money in order to work on theories which are highly controversial, when all these things are not controversial? You want to find a place to compromise? Why don't we compromise on the things that we have general agreement about instead of focusing all of our tensions on the things that we're bitterly divided on? Isn't that a reasonable compromise? And if you're not willing to accept that and compromise, well, then can you at least accept this one? If you are so committed to the idea that this is critical, then great, you can do it for your children. Let somebody else make a different decision for their children. Because in that argument, we're the ones providing options. We're the ones providing individual choice. And they're the ones insisting that we have to do what they say or they will punish us. That is a far stronger place to make an argument with respect to critical race theory. That's a far stronger argument to make with respect to what we've seen going on in our schools. And then finally, I think the other very reasonable argument is this. I better start seeing really quick these school administrators coming up with a coherent and intellectually honest and consistent policy with respect to what a teacher is going to be put on administrative leave for. Because it seems to me, whether it's at the university level or within public schools, it seems to me that there is one policy, if you are, if you are pushing for or a left-wing view of society and education, and there's a completely different policy with respect to getting punished within your career, if you have a different viewpoint. So either make up consistent rules and apply them consistently or, or, stop make, or stop telling us that we're seeing things that aren't there when the number of stories of, again, conservative teachers being punished seems to greatly outweigh the number of left-wing teachers that are being punished for doing things that are actually relatively similar when you look at it in a contextual basis. All right, and that moves us on to the last topic we're going to discuss today, Simone Biles. And I think this is important because, again, we're going to do the same thing that we've done for the last two. We're going to talk about bad conservative arguments, good conservative arguments. The question is, is Simone Biles a quitter? And I want to read something off from you from, uh, from uh, a coach. She said, we are talking about the same girl who was molested by her team doctor throughout her entire childhood and teen years, won the world all-around championship title while passing a kidney stone, put her body through an extra year of training through the pandemic, added so much difficulty to her routines that the judges literally do not know how to properly rate her skills because they are so ahead of her time. All of this while maintaining her responsibilities to her endorsement, deals, the media, personal relationships, etc. And some people can still honestly say Simone Biles is soft. She is a quitter. Okay. I, I've watched some of the conservative commentary about Simone Biles. And, and some of them have accused her of being soft or being a quitter or of letting her team down or letting the country down. And I will tell you right now, I think that argument is wrong. And here's why. Because it might not be for the reason that you think. I think that argument is wrong because when you look at someone like Simone, and yes, she has, a lot of, she has a lot of natural talent, but she is not in the Olympics and she has not accomplished what she has because of natural talent. She's done it because she's quite frankly worked her ass off. This 24-year-old has accomplished incredible things for herself, for her family, for her country. And in this event, 
she gave some reasons on why she was dropping out of the individual competition. And she cited, she gave some reasons that, that honestly, I think that if we could sit down and talk with her, she probably would have worded it differently. I don't know that, but I think it. Because she talked about how, you know, the, the fun element, you know, was it fun? There was a lot of pressure. Um, was she doing it for the right reasons or was she doing it for her or was she doing it for other people? And a lot of times, and again, if you're on the left and you're watching this, let me give you some insight into the way the conservatives look at this. It's not that we don't care about our mental health. It's not that we don't care about our physical health. It's not that we don't you know, appreciate everything that she has done. But whenever we see someone say that they are going to back out of a competition, which has implications not only for her, but for the team, for the country, et cetera, it's a little bit frustrating because people were depending on her. And because there's only so many slots for Olympians. So inevitably, somebody didn't get a slot or an opportunity to have in a slot because she has one. And so there's a certain degree of sympathy that we feel for other members of the team, for the country, for the person that didn't get an opportunity because Simone is now not going to compete. The question I think that we have to look at, if we're being intellectually honest about this, is what has she endured? What has she gone through? What has she accomplished? And does any of that earn her the benefit of the doubt when a 24-year-old young woman says that she's going to extricate herself from a particular competition? I think it does. I think it does. It doesn't mean that we, we don't have, and it doesn't mean that it's, it's not appropriate to feel disappointed or maybe even a little bit let down. But when someone has done so much and accomplished so much, and they say that they can't do it this time, then again, I'm, I'm willing to say, hey, I wish you could. Um, I, I wish you still would, but if, if you don't feel up to it, I'm certainly not going to sit here and say that you're a quitter or that you're a bad person um, or that you're weak or that you're soft. I'm not going to say that. I think the reason why the controversy came out of this is because of how some members of the press reacted to this. Because there were some members of the press that came in and said, my gosh, this is the most, this is the bravest and most historic thing she's done. And I think there was a natural conservative backlash to this idea that dropping out of something automatically made you, you know, this is the bravest thing that you've done, the most heroic thing. Because we're looking at that and going, well, no, wait a second. There is a price to be paid, not just by her. There is a price to be paid by other people as a result of her decision. And by saying that that decision is somehow, you know, inordinately brave or heroic seems problematic on the surface. Now, look, there could be underlying reasons that none of us know about that Simone hasn't shared that, that, that might make that decision braver than we would otherwise assume. But we have seen this trend on the left to make certain decisions and to elevate certain decisions to the level of bravery or heroism that quite frankly have little to nothing to do with what we conventionally understand as brave or heroic. And, and I'll give you an area where I see other people doing this as well. I'm, I'm a veteran, I've done two combat tours, I've been on, I don't know how many different combat operations. And every once in a while somebody, I would get back and they'd say, you know, you're a hero. I'd be like, no, I'm not. I did my job. And I think I did my job well, and I, I think the people that I served with would agree with that. But that doesn't make me a hero. I signed up for something, and when I was called to do it, I went and did it. Now, there are people that go completely above and beyond the call of duty, and that's generally what we associate with heroism. And so I think we need to be careful on how we use those terms, regardless of where you're coming from the political spectrum. But generally, we associate bravery and heroism with either standing up to do something that is self-sacrificial or doing it to the benefit of others at our own expense or, or facing incredible fear in doing what we said we were going to do anyways. Those are the things that we generally associate with bravery and heroism. And I think a lot of us as conservatives, we look at the Simone's decision and there's been two responses to it from the conservative side. One is to just say, no, you quit. And, you know, maybe I'll give you a pass because I like you, but you quit. You're not a hero. You're not brave. I, I think that's wrong. I, I honestly do. I, I think the appropriate conservative response to that is say, look, I'm not going to say what you did was brave or heroic. It might have been the right thing to do for you. You know, maybe given whatever the, the ultimate reasons were, 
Maybe it was the right thing to do for the team. It doesn't appear that way necessarily, but maybe it was. But what I am going to do is I'm going to give someone that has demonstrated incredible discipline, incredible strength, and, and courage, because I, I, do think, I do think it can be called courageous to, to operate under intense amounts of pressures and to discipline yourself to be able to compete at, at that sort of level. I'm going to recognize all those positive traits that you have demonstrated over of time, and I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Now, it may be that the decision you made was wrong, but it's not going to cause me to erase everything else that you've done in your life and suggest that now you're a bad person or now you're a letdown or now you're a quitter. And so I've been, again, I've been frustrated. The bad argument is to say that a decision that you don't agree with is somehow or some way negates everything else. The other thing I would say is this, and maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't seen Simone Biles once come out and say that she's the hero for doing this or she's brave for doing this. I think she's genuinely disappointed that this was the decision she felt she needed to make. It was the press that came on and decided to pick this up and run with it in a direction that a lot of us have an issue with and that I don't think even Simone agrees with necessarily. And so one of the things I think is, there's a really interesting article that was written by, by Peggy Noonan where she said, it, it's one thing to feel sympathy or empathy for something, but we should be careful what we celebrate. Someone deciding that because of mental health reasons, right before a competition, right? Because it's not like this was months before, but right before a competition deciding that they can't do something, that is something that I think is appropriate to show sympathy or empathy for, especially for someone that has demonstrated, you know, again, such discipline and self-sacrifice in the past. But I don't know that we want to necessarily elevate this to the, the level of, of being brave or heroic or something to celebrate. Now, again, it might be that other things come out and we realize that, no, this was, you know, it did require a certain degree of bravery because she wanted to do it and she couldn't. And there was, again, there were some other reasons. The reasons that were offered, um, you know, again, I think most of us on the conservative side, we would have said to ourselves, okay, I get it. But one of the attributes of being a, an Olympian is overcoming challenges for the benefit of your team and your country. That, that's part of, you're not just competing for yourself in the Olympics. Um, but again, having said all that, I, I don't, I think Simone's earned the benefit of the doubt. The media, on the other hand, has not. And, and always leave it to the media to take an opportunity to manipulate something or push something in a particular direction in order to achieve something that ultimately has little to nothing to do with Simone's decision in this case. I think it has more to do with a, a particular agenda that they're pushing with respect to their progressive view of the world, as opposed to a difficult decision that a young woman had to make um, in, in, in the Olympics. But we as conservatives should be very, very careful on, on how we address this issue. I, I think there's a way to address it that respects Simone and all of her accomplishments, while at the same time saying that it's inappropriate for the media to take this in a direction that I don't think was ever intended and is not appropriate. But if we don't make that distinction, here's what's going to happen. The bad conservative argument's going to reign, and all of a sudden, here we are, a bunch of conservatives, picking on a very hardworking, very strong, very accomplished young woman that has represented her country wonderfully over several competitions to include the Olympics. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be perceived as doing that, and I don't want to actually do that in practice. So let's make the distinction between Simone, the decision, and her history, and then let's make the distinction between what some members of the press might be trying to use this for in a purpose that I don't even think Simone intends. All right. I want to thank you once again for joining us and making the argument where, once again, we make the arguments that equip all of us to be able to defend a free society. Please check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. If you get a moment, leave us a review. Write us your, uh, your questions, your responses. We read through those things. We use your feedback in order to determine what future episodes are going to look like. So the more you participate, the more you're going to get a product you want. Once again, I'm Nick Freitas with Making the Argument. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.